All right, I'm going to start recording because if I don't, it's like this class never happened. So uh, can everyone see my uh, lecture for here on the screen share? Good? All right. So thank you. I like the thumbs. Welcome back, folks. We have a, a brand new unit to start today, so that's always exciting. Uh, other kinds of not normal continuous outcomes. So sort of a potpourri of, of other topics that are related to generalized models um, and a few additional generalized models. So that's where we're starting off with. So just to remind you where we've been and uh, what's this is the end of the generalized portion of the class. So the big difference between general models and generalized models is the addition of a link function that solves any boundary issues, so it keeps predicted outcomes within the boundaries of what the outcome could possibly be. And it picks a different conditional distribution besides normal that, again, better matches what the outcomes could possibly be. And I have a side note to those of you who've been through uh, training in multi-level models. You can do generalized models in those as well. And in fact, in the fall class that I'm doing on clustered multi-level models, we will have a unit on generalized extensions for those. In that case, the level two random effects have a multivariate normal distribution still. It's the level one distribution that changes. So just as an aside about that. So what we've talked about thus far then, uh, categorical outcomes was the first unit after a review of general models. So we have either logit, probit, log log, or complementary log log as potential link functions for binary outcomes and for ordinal and nominal outcomes. In terms of the conditional distributions, Bernoulli is what we would use for binary, and multinomial, which is a generalization of Bernoulli for more than two categories, is what we would use for ordinal or nominal. So a review real quick. If I'm using the same kind of distribution for an ordinal outcome as for a nominal, how do I know which I have? How would those models differ from each other? Ordinal versus nominal. Cough, cough, homework three. As usual, you can talk to me or you can type in the chat. Pretty sure Zoom doesn't have an icon for the answer for this question though. Question is, if both ordinal and nominal outcomes use a multinomial distribution, what? how do I tell them apart? You have a chance to practice with both of those kinds in homework three, which is why I'm uh, bringing this up again. How do models for ordinal outcomes differ from models for nominal outcomes if they both use the same conditional distribution? Here come some answers. Is it the reference group or the submodel or the same slope coefficients or not? Yeah, kind of all of that. So the, the type of submodel, I would say, is, is the place to start. So ordinal outcomes use cumulative submodels. So if I have an ordinal outcome that's 1, 2, 3, 4, the first submodel would be 1 versus 2, 3, 4. The second would be 1, 2 versus 3, 4. The third would be 1, 2, 3 versus 4. And the cumulative part enforces ordering of the intercepts so that the probabilities are always increasing as you move up on x. And in those, is the recording on? Yes, it is. I hope it is. <laughs> Thank you for checking. Yes, it is on. We're good. Um, I record not in Zoom, but on a separate piece of software. That way we don't have the Zoom windows on the, on the recordings. So we have cumulative versus not cumulative in terms of not the distribution, but the link function. So in a cumulative model, which is for ordinal, we use all the answer categories and all the submodels, and by default, the slopes are constrained to be equal across the submodels. You can change that. And in fact, in homework three, I ask you to do so in a second model. For nominal, that's where we talk about the idea of a reference outcome rather than a reference group, because essentially it's like dummy coding your outcome. So in a nominal model, one outcome category is designated as the reference, and the submodels give you the logit of the probability of responding in each other category instead of the reference. So putting all of that together, 
ordinal and nominal outcome models share the same conditional distribution because multinomial is the only job that it does is allow a different probability for every possible response category. They differ in their link function. Ordinal models use cumulative link functions and nominal models use um, what is known as generalized logit or baseline category logit where each submodel only has two choices in it. So that's homework three. Homework two was binary, which I believe most folks have gotten done with. Uh, the one I haven't talked about yet, but which I will open probably within the next week or so, is counts. So we just finished talking about counts, where in almost every case, the link function for a count outcome is going to be the log. And you remember why we use log and not logit for counts? We talked about this last time. They're easy to confuse because they sound the same. Yeah, log has one lower boundary at zero. So the job of the log is to ensure that the predicted counts stay above zero. The log can go below zero, but the predicted count cannot. Yeah, one boundary instead of two. Logits are for two boundaries. Logits are coming back today, as it turns out. Um, the big thing with counts is trying to figure out what kind of distribution you need. So Poisson is the simplest in which the conditional mean and the conditional variance are supposed to be the same. You can add a stretchy factor to it, known as over dispersion, that allows the variance to exceed the mean, that's negative binomial. And to each of those you can potentially add a zero inflation submodel that allows extra zeros and you can predict the probability that someone is an extra zero. So the big trick with counts is trying to figure out what the distribution should look like we can use a Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom index of distribution fit to help us with those decisions. Where we are now is talking about other kinds of continuous outcomes. So they, they're, we're moving from things that are treated as discrete, only whole numbers or only categories, into things that are truly continuous. But they may have boundaries that we still need to address. So we're going to talk about proportions first. I have a, uh, just a tiny bit on truncated or bounded outcomes that, are, that you can use that are known as censored models, and then also things that are continuous but skewed. So response time, as an example. It's a continuous variable. A lot of the time people will treat it as if it's normally distributed, but it's usually really skewed. So there are choices for that that can do a better job. The same thing is true of variables that involve money. A lot of times those are positively skewed as well, and they can't go below zero. So there are models known as log normal or log normal or gamma distributions that are designed for those. So that's in this unit as well. And the same issue shows up as for counts. If we have zero values and the distribution doesn't have that built in, then we need, may need to add some kind of hurdle variant to simultaneously predict zero values along with the rest of the distribution. So we have this list of generalized models that'll take us the next couple weeks. After that, we switch to multivariate. So the idea of predicting more than one outcome for a person at a time, such as in a path model, such as is needed to test hypotheses of mediation. And you can do those sorts of things with general and generalized models. So sort of bringing it full circle, then ending it with multivariate generalized by the end of the semester, which is only in six more weeks of classes, right? The countdown has begun. So beyond categories and counts then, we're talking about not normal outcomes that are plausibly continuous, continuous or what I call continue-ish. This is not a real word. Continue-ish is my word for things that aren't really continuous, but people treat them as if they are because it's close enough that it's plausible. So things like um, percent correct, you can think of as continuous, but it's tr not truly because it, it's based on, there's only so many possible values based on how many items you have, but it's close enough to something that you can think of as continuous. Um, another category would be scale scores. So if you add up, um, you know, the number of response, if you add up all the responses on a scale where each item goes from one to five, for instance, the resulting scale sum or the mean, if you divide by the number of items, is often treated as a continuous variable, even though it's really not, but it has boundaries to it because there is a scale floor and a scale ceiling. So if you are in a situation where you're measuring something that 
is inherently not normal, like most people will be at a pile at the beginning or at the end, then you still have the same kinds of boundary issues to address as we have for categorical outcomes. And as with counts, though, we have to figure out what kind of conditional distribution is going to work because we have a lot of information in, in that continuous variable that we need to account for with respect to its variability. And then sometimes there are outcomes that are naturally bounded at zero, such as money, um, time, minutes of physical activity, for instance. Those are common outcomes that people use for these sorts of models as well. And we can use a log type link for these to make sure that the prediction stays above zero. But then again, the question is, what kind of distribution do we need? And for things that are continuous, like money and response time, we can't use the count distributions. Those are only for discrete integer whole number types of outcomes. So we're back to too logit to quit, Mr. MC Hammer. I didn't cite the, the, uh, the YouTube link, but it's in the categorical lecture if you want to revisit it. We're going to use logits to predict proportions. So a proportion is an outcome that ranges between 0 and 1, or you can think of it as predicting a percent that would range from 0 to 100. The question is where you put the decimal. Functionally, you can think of them as equivalent. So in predicting proportions, we'll stick with that terminology, we have the same issues in terms of having two boundaries as we had for a binary outcome. So a binary outcome, what you're actually trying to predict is the probability of a 1, and that probability needs to stay between 0 and 1. So the conditional mean is the probability. The same thing is true in these models we are going to use the idea of each potential trial as the basis for the prediction. So in these models, we are going to predict the probability of a 1 for any trial, meaning multiple items. As trials is the term that people typically use, but you can think of it if it's percent correct on a measure, something like that. Proportion correct would be the number of, of items possible. So we're going to predict the probability of a 1 for any one item and understand that we can multiply that probability of a 1 times the number of items to get to the predicted number correct. So we're reverse engineering our way into being able to use a binomial distribution that predicts the number of correct, uh, number of events, so to speak, out of possible trials as opposed to, for example, number of correct responses out of the number possible on a test, something like that. So we have the same link and inverse link that you've already seen. What we're predicting is the log of the probability of a 1 divided by 1 minus the probability. So that's the probability of a 0 in the denominator here. And if we want to inverse link back to the data, that probability can be expressed as e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logit. So we, the same order of operations applies. We use the logit slopes and intercepts to create predicted outcomes we can then back translate those predicted outcomes into predicted probabilities. That means we can still use odds ratios as our effect size, where we unlogit it, basically e to the logit slope gives you the odds ratio. The catch here is that we have to figure out what kind of conditional distribution we need. So the nice part about binary outcomes is that you can't be wrong. Like, there's only really one choice. Same with multinomial for categorical. Here, we can be wrong. So there's a lot of choices, and I have a handout that walks us through some of the ones that I've found to be most useful. Um, there's even more out there, so this again could be like its own course if I wanted it to be. And these are the software packages that we're going to be using in this unit to do uh, binary or binomial outcomes, things like proportion correct. All right, questions so far as I reload my caffeination. Cheers. It's a quiet group today. Happy Thursday? You're like, is it? I'm trying to make it that way. No questions. Am I still talking? Can you hear me? <laughs> I'm shameless in trying to uh, get audience participation. There's a thumb. There's a nod. Okay, some people can hear me. Good enough. 
So we're going to be using as sort of our base type of distribution binomial. And I can guarantee you've seen this before at some point and someone talked to you about coin flips or some shit like that. Like that's, this is when you would have seen that. The idea of binomial is that you have repeated events and for each possibility, you have a chance of having something happen or not. So it's easiest for me to think of this in terms of predicting number correct on a test, right? What For each item, you have some probability of getting that item correct. And these models are designed to predict the probability of getting any one item correct. That probability times the number of items then gives you your expected number correct. So the distribution, uh, the probability density function for that looks like this. Uh, we don't need to worry about that too much. I think the picture is a lot easier for us to keep track of. The th so this is a picture I stole from the internet, from this place down here. And this is the expected distribution from the binomial for different levels of P as the one parameter. So we're back to only having one. And then 20 different trials. So the example you would have seen in intro stat is like, let's say we flipped a coin 20 times. Like, how many times are we going to get heads or whatever? Uh, if we put this in an educational context, we can think about predicting proportion correct on an, on an exam. So if the probability from this distribution is 0.1, what that means is that for any item, I have a 10% chance of getting it right. That would result in a distribution of scores for the 20 items that looks like these blue lines. So this would be like a really hard test, or if this were a behavioral kinds of analysis, this would be something to where I'm measuring really severe behaviors, and for any one people are not very likely to endorse it. So you see sort of a pileup at the low end in this case, where having zero correct is not only possible, but likely it's very likely that we would have only one correct or two correct or three correct, and it's not as likely that we would have more than maybe six or seven. So the probability of getting any one item correct times the number of items, that's what this distribution is trying to predict. But what we're going to, what the model is going to give us directly is the probability of any one item correct. So it's very much like just predicting a binary outcome, but then you multiply that probability times the number of items. The red one is what would we would expect if each item had a probability correct of 0.5. Then the most likely score is 10 items correct out of 20. And you have a distribution to the left and to the right. So for something like this, pretending that it's normal is maybe not a terrible thing. Because even though it's, it's discrete, it is symmetric and we're not anywhere near the boundaries in terms of where the data fall, and so we're not likely to go out of bounds for this type of outcome. Where we have to worry about boundaries again would be the green one, which is the reverse of the blue if we have a probability of 0.9. And so here, this anticipates having a ceiling effect where the highest you can get is 20 out of 20, and there is no further tail to the distribution the way that we see the red tail kind of fall out. So this distribution is built for outcomes that have ceiling effects or floor effects, but not both. For, if you have both, then you need something else. But this is sort of the starting point in the same way that Poisson was the starting point for counts. In Poisson, it's one parameter because the mean and the variance are supposed to be the same thing. This distribution has one parameter, the probability of a one. Because, though, we have more choices, not just one set of zeros or ones, but, you know, 20 of them or whatever, we have the chance for overdispersion. So we can have extra variance relative to what the binomial model predicts, and we have choices about how to deal with that. So the term overdispersion means more variability than expected. You can technically have underdispersion as well, less variability than expected, but that's not as likely in most data sets. Overdispersion can be caused by a bunch of different things. It could be an index of model misspecification, like if you have terms that are missing. It could also happen because you have clustering, so you have dependent observations rather than independent observations. And there's two different ways that I'll show you that how we can fix it. It's what's known as additive overdispersion or multiplicative overdispersion. 
So I came across the first one in the context of longitudinal analyses for proportion correct over time, where the only thing that I could find was this idea of additive over dispersion. It turns out that we're going to hack a multi-level model to do this. We're going to basically treat it as a two-level analysis rather than one, even though we only have one level of sampling. The multiplicative version of over dispersion is analogous to what we had with negative binomial, where we allow the variance to grow with the mean in a quadratic fashion, so it's multi it multiplies it, it's the stretchy factor multiplies it, it's analogous to that, but it requires something called the beta binomial distribution instead. So here's what beta looks like just by itself. So I stole this picture from Wikipedia because there is absolutely no way I would have been able to produce it myself. I do not understand beta at all, and I probably never will, but I'm okay with that. So the beta distribution, here's the density function for it. It has something called an alpha parameter and a B parameter, beta, I guess, and they are labeled as shape parameters. So here are different functions that can be created by different combinations of values for these things. So as you can see, it's like anything under the sun can be created by this distribution. It's super flexible. So the pink line here, the pink line to me looks kind of like a normal distribution. That's what would happen if both alpha and beta were two. Um, the, let's see here, the black line looks to me like a positively skewed count looking sort of thing. That's what happens if beta is bigger than alpha. Um, we have blue and green as sort of like crazy skewednesses. And then we have the red one where the mass is highest at the ends. So this would be like a bimodal distribution almost where you have floor and ceiling effects predominantly, but not much in the middle. So why this shows up is because it's super flexible. What the hell alpha and beta mean, I have no idea. But you can put them together into creating a mean that is a probability because this beta distribution ranges between zero and one. And you can have a scale factor that somehow adds these together. That involves something approximating variance, but not quite because invariance is this thing. So I will be quite honest with you. I have no idea what to do with this. What I do know is that the reason that I've never needed to figure it out is because beta does not include zero or one. So I have never once been in a situation where I needed to model to predict a proportion and I never had zero values or one values. I always had one or the other. It was always included. And so beta by itself is not very useful. So if you wanted to use beta, and you had zeros and ones in your data, you would essentially have to build hurdles into it. So you'd add a, if it's zero or not submodel, you would have a beta model for the continuous part in the middle. And then if you had a one, you'd have to add a third submodel for whether it's one. So not many hypotheses lend themselves to that sort of splitting up across submodels, in my opinion. Where this thing shows up, though, is that we can hack it to turn the binomial into something that has extra variance. So beta binomial is like a hybrid thing where the p parameter itself follows a beta distribution. What that means, practically speaking, is that it allows variance to exceed the mean in the binomial in the same way that negative binomial allowed variance to exceed the mean in Poisson. So it's, it's a directly analogous case. The fact that it's directly analogous is not obvious because every author describes this differently and I have done my very best to try and track what actually happens in terms of what the model is saying, and I have had great difficulty in figuring it out. So I'm not 100% on this, but I have sort of the gist of it enough to where I think I can show it to you and do a reasonable job of explaining it. All right, let me show you. Come on, there we go. Let me show you an example. How's that? We like examples, don't we? Much better than algebra. This is another true story. So this is example 4a. This is real data, which is why it's not in your download folder. Um, the data were taken from one occasion of a longitudinal study of which I was the third author. So this is one of the studies I worked on in graduate school when I was teaching uh, 
teaching myself how to do growth curve modeling with the help of the people who I was working with, but I didn't take a class on it or anything like that. It was me with the book trying to figure this shit out by myself. And we were predicting grammatical tense deficits in children with SLI and nonspecific language impairment and the relation with nonverbal IQ over time. So bigger picture is that this is one contribution in a line of research. The PI is Mabel Rice at the University of Kansas. She's a big deal in that field. And she spent her career studying something called specific language impairment, which in children means that these are children who otherwise do not have any, um, any disabilities or any um, non-typical development issues. They, they can hear just fine. Their um, IQs are well within you know, the, the standard range, whatever that means. But for whatever reason, they have difficulty learning rules of grammar. So you can ask them questions like, do the boy run fast? And they're like, yeah, he does. Why you ask me that? Where they wouldn't recognize that that doesn't sound right. Like, does the boy run run fast is the correct answer. So there's there's a there's a very specific, hence the term, language impairment that some children exhibit. It has a genetic component. Um, it tends to stay with children as they get older to where when they're adults, they get better, but they're never quite at the level that people without this particular condition have. So that's the backstory of this. The, um, this is one occasion of a long, longer-term data set that I took for this example, and I want to show you what the distribution looks like for this one occasion. So this is the outcome that we're going to be modeling. How would you describe this distribution? What might be some vocabulary words we could use to describe this? Positively skewed. Uh, close. It's the other way around. Yeah, this is negatively skewed because it's where the tail goes is the, the name of the skewness. It's, it's backwards and from how you would think about it, but skewed definitely. Uh, beyond, yes, beyond skewness. Left tailed, I'll take that. One inflated. Yeah, it looks like I've got a big old what I call a ceiling effect is what the name for it because I got a pile of people who got all the items right. Uh, my guess is that at least some of the people in the pile are children without language impairment for whom this task is relatively straightforward. Yeah, not truly continuous either. That's because there's only a finite number of items and I computed a proportion correct out of those items, but there's only so many possible values. So this is skewed with a ceiling effect, not really continuous, but it's continue-ish, I'll say. And do you know what kind of model I fit to this in the publication? That was published in, what journal is this? Yep, the journal actually that I have published the most in in my career, believe it or not, Journal of Speech Language Hearing Research. Because of the people I've collaborated with, that's my most common place I've published. Do you know what kind of model I fit to this in that journal? What kind of conditional distribution I, I used? No one wants to guess? Linear regression with the normal distribution? Binomial? Any other guesses? Beta? Beta binomial? The correct answer is normal. It wasn't a linear regression because this was longitudinal data. So at least I got that part right. I fit a multi-level model, but I used a normal distribution with no link function. So identity link, conditionally normal. Do you know why that is? Vladimir is laughing. Tell everyone why that is, Vladimir. I would say that you were not the Lisa you are right now. That is right. I did not know any better. <laughs> <laughs> 2002, Lisa had never heard of these models. As it turns out, I would say I learned in graduate school maybe 5 to 10% of what I know in total. I learned the rest of it in having to teach it or having to work on analyses for other people where I had to learn something new. 
So I am trying to learn from my mistakes and think about what I may have done differently. And yes, I did once I figured out this, um, I went back and fit like the right models to this just for my own edification and none of the conclusions that, changed, that were reported in the paper changed. So I still feel okay about that. But that is to say, we don't always know the best, rightest way to do things. We do the best that we know how at the time. And as, as time progresses, hopefully we learn more and we do better. So this is me trying to grow. I could tell you all kinds of stories about papers that have my name on them that I now know are wrong. My favorite is a paper that I wrote all by myself. I am the only author, so I can't blame anyone else. Um, it was published in 2007, and it won an award for a journal that was the best paper of the year. It's wrong. It's completely wrong, and I know that now. I have never actually done the analyses to prove that it's wrong, but based on all the things that I've learned since then, it's wrong. And I'm in an un uncomfortable position when I review articles sometimes where they cite that paper, and they're like, Hoffman 2007 did this, and I'm like, nah, you don't want to do it that way anymore. Don't, don't follow Hoffman 2007. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So we all learn. We all grow. So I'm going to do this a little differently than what I would have done before. This does not look normal. Now, it's hard for me to tell what it is because all of the assumptions that we deal with with respect to what the distribution should be is not the marginal data like this. It's the residuals. So I can't look at this histogram and know for sure what kind of distribution I need. But I can look at the characteristics of the data and point me towards a family. And the fact that I know that I'm dealing with proportion correct where no matter what data set I'm in, it ranges from zero to one by definition. The fact that in this sample, it looks like I have this one inflation. This is gonna point me towards a binomial type of family to handle this, but I know that I may need to consider whether or not I have more variance than expected and whether I have too many one values here relative to what the binomial would predict. If we look at the, where's the picture here? If we look at the binomials in the picture, like if we look at the green one here, this is the closest that we have to what my data look like, but even the binomial doesn't predict as many people with a perfect score as what I have. So the question is like, are there too many people in the one pile and do I need some kind of one inflation model to be able to address that? A uh, question from the Zoomer, when that happens, presumably when you write a paper and you realize it's wrong later, can you rewrite the paper like have an addition 2.0 um, that makes me wonder how many papers out there are incorrect. Is this common? You can issue a correction. So if it's something to where, um, like, let's say that, you know, a figure was, was printed incorrectly and it was somehow misleading, you can issue a correction. And those will eventually make their way into when someone downloads the paper, they'll download the corrected version and there'll be a note. If you, if you realized that you made a terrible mistake, like you, let's say you, did, you found out that somebody faked the data or you merged the data incorrectly and you, and you come back after the fact and you realize that nothing from the paper should be out there in the literature, you can retract it. I've never been in a situation where something was like so wrong that I had to do that. This is sort of like shades of gray as to what the rightest model would be where reasonable people might disagree. Um, Yes, there are a lot of incorrect things out there. And the bottom line is that just because a paper was published doesn't make it right. We are all our own peer reviewers. We all have to read through things and come to our own conclusions as to whether the arguments the author is making are supported, whether the choices they made for their analysis are reasonable. Um, there's not always a one single correct answer. But I could tell you that if the 2020, 2023 Lisa looks at this picture very differently, than 2002 Lisa did. I try to keep it real, right? The, just because like I have a 10 year track job or whatever doesn't make me know everything. So maybe 10 years from now, I'll look at this lecture and go, okay, I screwed that up. And now here's the more writer version of it. Okay, so negatively skewed, ranges from zero to one, so I want to make sure I keep my predictions in bounds, and I'm concerned about maybe having too many ones, but we'll see what happens in, when we look at uh, how the distribution fit measures tell us about that as we proceed. So I have some disclaimers about what packages and things I'm using here. 
As usual, I give you these steps to import and create data because there's some extra pieces to be able to fit this same model. It's specified differently when you use Stata versus R than when you use SAS. So I have SAS code and output in the online materials. I pulled that from here since most people aren't using that package at this point. So here is first off Stata code. The data originally contained these variables. So I have one grouping variable that's called NLI v SLI, which is whether or not the child had specific language impairment, where zero is the reference group for no, they did not. Mom ed 12, which is mother's education in years, centered at 12. So this is not a continuous variable, but we're pretending like it is. Um, mother's education is one of those things in this field that you have to control for or someone's going to yell at you. And the outcome, as I originally envisioned it, was proportion correct, the number, the proportion correct on this indicator of one's grammatical understanding. The outcome that we're predicting, though, is not going to be proportion directly. Proportion happens indirectly. The information that we're going to feed Stata and R is the number of correct answers and the number of total answers. From that, the model is going to build the proportion out of it. I did not have that in the original data when I went to build this example, so I had to reverse engineer it. So I generated a new variable that I'm calling number of trials because that's the way that the documentation talks about it, so I'm trying to be consistent, where I'm saying I had 100 trials, and then I'm generating number correct as the proportion that was in the data set times number of trials rounded to the nearest one. So I'm reverse engineering the number correct that would have been used to build the proportion in the first place because I didn't happen to have it. I'm also generating number incorrect because I'm going to need that to use an R. And I'm generating proportion incorrect because I need that for other things as well. This example is going to use two specific Stata routines that are not built in, but they were user written, and you can download them and install them. So this is code that allows you to do that. If you take off the comments and turn it on, search beta bin and search zbin will go open up a, a web page where those packages are listed. You can then download them and install them inside your Stata. And that does work on the uh, user virtual desktop as well as on a desktop application. I've checked and you can do it. By the way, you will not have a homework in the online homework system on this unit. So some of this is going to be, I think, um, overly complicated because of the different packages that get pulled in and I didn't want to deal with trying to keep everything the same across the homework platform. But you can use these models on your own individual data analysis homework five if you wish. So first thing we're going to do is summarize the proportion correct so I can get some descriptive statistics. We'll see how the empty model spits those back to us. And then I made a picture to do the histogram. So this picture uh, right here I pulled from SAS. It shows the overlay of a normal distribution, and you can tell that that's clearly not an accurate picture. In R, I imported the original SAS data set. So in all of the R examples I've shown you thus far, I think I imported an Excel data set. I wanted you to have an example of how to do other kinds. So the Haven package in R has a function called read SAS that allows you to read in SAS data sets. You can also read in SPSS data sets or Stata data sets, all different kinds of data sets. I did the same computations in terms of reverse engineering number correct and number incorrect. Um, out of my proportion correct because we need those in R. And then I figured out how to make a histogram in R, so yay me. All right, so first thing we're going to do, as we have done, I think, in um, we did in the binary and categorical units, empty model. Remember the term empty model? That vocabulary word? What's empty model mean? No predictors. Yes, no predictors, exactly right. And why would I do that? Why am I going to do that? To compare fit to other models, that could be one reason. 
So if I wanted to use likelihood ratio tests to judge the contribution of my predictors, then I need an empty model as a baseline. Uh, I'm not going to do that in this case. I'm going to use wall tests instead, but that could be one reason. Uh, what about in terms of just figuring out your software? Yeah, see which way your model is going? Exactly right. Get the baseline mean of the outcome. Yes. The empty model will allow you to figure out what your software is doing because you should be able to figure out how it recreates the variable's mean and you know what that is. So it is somewhat of a pedagogical reason, but it's also literally what I do in practice. Um, this morning I was trying to figure out Tobit regression, which is censored regression, and I was fitting empty models to try and figure out how I could get back to the mean of the variable from the model parameters. I was unsuccessful. Um, I suspect integration is involved and that's why I was unsuccessful, but that was what I was doing, even now, myself. So, yep, trying to figure out the, the lay of the land, so to speak. So we're doing an empty binomial model so that I can describe how this process works in translating number correct into proportion correct. And I have syntax and output in both Stata and R for everything because the way that it looks is sufficiently different to where I needed to do so. So bear with me as we go through the pieces. So first off, I have what I'm doing here. I'm treating number correct as a binomially distributed variable where the parameters for that is just P, which is going to be the probability of getting any one item correct. And I need, also need to know the number of trials. So in binomial terminology, they talk about number total as number of trials, and they talk about the outcome to be predicted as the event. So I'm using those words to map onto what traditional documentation says, but you can think of this as the event is to get an item right, and the number of trials is the total number of items that you have contributing to that outcome variable. So this is an empty model. There it is, the logit for the probability of getting any trial correct, any item correct, is just my fixed intercept beta zero. That's it. So the conditional mean the model is going to, to provide then is the probability, that's what the model is going to give me, of getting any one item correct times the number of items gets me to the expected number correct. So number correct is what I'm actually predicting. I'm reverse engineering it through this proportion though. The conditional variance is the same as what it would be in a Bernoulli type distribution where it's the mean minus one minus the mean. So the variance is a function of the mean. It's non-constant, but they're tied together the same as it is in Bernoulli. In Stata, I'm back to the GLM. So GLM stands for Generalized Linear Models in Stata. It, it's used to fit a whole bunch of different kinds. The reason that I'm using that is so that I can get my Pearson Chi-Square Index of Distribution fit because it's spit out for me readily. I'm predicting number correct in Stata. So the outcome in terms of the column is the count number correct. It is a discrete outcome that's going in here. I'm telling it to do the prediction using a logit link. The distribution family is binomial, and when you tell it binomial, it says, hey, how many trials are there? And then no log means shut off that part of the output that shows the iteration history, so it's a little bit shorter. So here is a really nice feature. The reason that people use proportion correct in the first place is to control for different numbers of total items. So if somebody has 10 items that they answered and someone else answered 15, of course the person who got 15 is likely to have a higher number correct. But to put them back on the same scale, we convert number correct to proportion correct. So these models allow you to directly input the number and the number possible as variables. That means not everybody has to have the same. So if you have people with different numbers of opportunities to do something, that's a variable that your analysis can then incorporate so that you have a fair comparison across people with different total numbers of possibilities. So proportion correct is designed to control for differences in number possible. The same thing happens here directly in the model specification. Okay, with me so far, or any questions you'd like to interject with.
Hi, Lisa. I have a question about the distribution of the outcome you just showed. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the fact that in the count data example, we are concerned that, for example, if the data set does not contain zero, mm -hmm. and in this case of this proportion, looking at the Instagram, I'm thinking we do not have those some kind of lower numbers. Does that make any difference here or we just assume it doesn't make any difference? I don't think it makes a difference because if the mean is really high, then that translates into very, very few cases of low expected values. So if we go, let me pull up this, this picture again. Like if we look at the green distribution here, this is this is literally a binomial. Like if I, I generated the data, like or this person is showing what it would look like if the distribution was a perfect fit. And the green case here is when the p-value for the probability for the distribution is 0.9. So that translates into nobody is expected to get only like 10 items correct if the probability of getting each item is as high as 0.9. So I, I don't think it's a problem that we don't have the entire range of the possible variable observed because that's a consequence of the fact that for most of the children, this was an easy test. The same thing is true in reverse if you have a probability of 0.1. The, there are a lot of people who got a perfect score though, and that is why I have to use some kind of binomial and not beta. Beta does not have one as part of the distribution. Beta is between zero and one, so it doesn't have zeros and doesn't have ones. I definitely need a distribution that has ones here. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Okay, so I'm feeding in number correct and number of trials. What the model is going to give me back is essentially the proportion correct. So I get my coefficient here for the constant, which I call fixed intercept otherwise. That coefficient is 2.46. What does that mean? Does it mean that I have 2.46 predicted successes? Seems like that could be plausible. And feel free to read from the screen. 2.46 means what? What scale is it in first off? Logits. These are logits. Yes, this is a logit link model. So all the coefficients are in log odds, logits. The log of the odds of the probability of a one. So 2.45 in logits is a positive number. A logit of 0 corresponds to a probability of 0.5, so a positive logit I know is a probability greater than 0.5. And in fact, if I do the translation, e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logit, this is my inverse link function. My, re my reverse link function, I think as a few of you said, I like that one too. That translates into a probability of 0 0.92. 0 0.9212 to be specific. And that number, 0.9212, is exactly the mean of this variable. That gives me, uh, that gives me uh, confidence that I know what I'm doing. So the intercept is the logit that corresponds to the proportion correct in the original outcome. So even though I fed in number correct and number total, it's working in proportions for all intents and purposes. So the way that I would interpret 0.92 as a model parameter is that 0.92 is the probability of getting any one item correct. When I multiply that by the 100 items I said that I had, then the expected value would be 92.1 for the number correct. So number correct is still being predicted at the end of the day. It's just doing it through this roundabout proportion mechanism. And so that's why in Stata, if you use margins to get predicted outcomes, and you don't specify predict XB, meaning I want the logit version, the default is the inverse link, what it gives me is 92. 92 is the expected number correct 
out of the hundred that I said I had. But the model directly predicts the probability that any one of those trials would be correct, which is 0.92. So I know that can be confusing, which is why I'm trying to make a big deal of it. But is, does that make sense, or do I need to say more or differently? One thumb. So yes, at the end of the day, we're predicting proportion correct still, but we're doing it by telling it the number correct and the number total, which means they're variables that can differ across people. So in R, here's another example of me, me learning things. Um, the first time that I ever tried to learn R was in, I think, the spring of 2021. So I've only been using R for two years, and as you know, it's against my, uh, I'm doing it grudgingly and without enthusiasm. I know. So I'm, a, I'm an R novice relative to all the other packages that I picked up. The good news is that once you learn one package, learning the second one and the third one gets easier and easier because you get used to how these things work. But when I was prepping R for this class for the first time a year ago, I went through, you know, I asked the internet, how do I do a binomial model? And I found the same package that we had used for categorical, VGLM. And I found a function within it called binomial FF, which apparently is different than binomial without the Fs, because, of course, link equals logit link. Multiple responses equals false, meaning you can actually store across multiple columns rather than coming up with the total if you want to. And when I first saw the opportunity to put two values in this formula, I put in the same two that I put it in Stata. I thought, okay, well, one of these has to be number correct and the other one needs to be number total, so here we go. And I didn't get the same results. After considerable trial and error, I figured out that R wants the number incorrect as the second option, not the total. So it computes the total for you from number correct and incorrect, whereas Stata wants number correct and total. So easy thing to screw up. But if I hadn't estimated an empty model and known what the answer is, I would not have known that I had misinterpreted these instructions. So empty model for the win. So here is the solution. There's my 2.45 in logits, which back translates to a probability of 0.92, which is the proportion correct on average. And I had in previous handouts ignored this, but I wanted to put a shout out to this warning that I got that I have a Hawk Donner effect. I had never heard this term before until I saw this warning message. And so I asked the Google, what the hell is that? And I found some description of it on this website. So Basically, it means that it had a hard time figuring out what that number should be, which is not surprising because the mean is pretty near the boundary of the variable, and it's going to get worse as we add predictors, actually. And so this error message will continue to show up on all of the outputs, but this is what it means. I asked for the intercept in probability by accessing the stored coefficients and e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logiting them. This is the shorter version of the formula where it's 1... Um, plus e to the not logit in the denominator, there's only one in the numerator. So that's just a shorter way of writing the same formula. And because r doesn't do it for you directly, I had to build my own Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom index of distribution fit. So the code to do this is exactly the same as we saw for the count models. I'm asking for the sum of the Pearson residuals squared, and then I'm dividing by degrees of freedom. And so I had saved a variable to my R script for N right here, right here. That was the first thing that I did. That way, if I want to reuse my code for a different data set, I would only have to change N one time and not in every single model where I go and ask for this information. So generally speaking, when you're writing syntax, it's good to anticipate the fact that you would want to reuse the syntax at a later date and save yourself the trouble of having to change the same number in multiple places. If you can make an abbreviation for it, so if I can just define n as 97 here, then everywhere else in my code, it will update to a different value if I change it in the one spot. 
So I'm only changing the number of fixed effects because that is a model specific quantity. So either way I look at it, my Pearson chi-square over degrees of freedom statistic is 21. It's supposed to be one. So what that means is if I have approximately 21 times as much variance as I'm supposed to have according to the binomial. That's not good. Maybe that's because I don't have any useful predictors in my model yet, so let's try and add some. So for the rest of this handout, I'm using the same two predictors, and there's no interaction terms. The focus is just on the, the link function and the distribution. So I'm adding in a fixed slope for the distinction of NLI versus SLI, so non-specific language impairment as my reference group, specific language impairment as the one alternative group. So this slope is going to directly tell me how proportion correct in logits differs in SLI instead of NLI, and mother's education centered at 12 years so that my reference person for the intercept is someone whose mother has a high school degree. The rest of this is the same because I'm still using a binomial model. So in terms of the code, I pick up two new continuous or quantitative predictors in Stata. That's what C dot refers to. You don't technically have to do that all the time, but I tend to do it because sometimes it yells at me if I don't, so I've gotten in the habit of just doing it. Otherwise, everything's the same. We have our two new slopes right here. They both look to be wildly significant. So my constant is now about three. What is that? If I were to try to put that three in a sentence, how would my sentence go? This is my fixed intercept. Who's feeling brave? And if you're not feeling brave, you can direct message me in the chat and no one will know. Putting the three in a sentence. Got one sentence for children without SLI whose mothers have 12th grade ed. That is my reference group. Now, three is what? I've got to put the three in the sentence somewhere. Three is the prediction for that kind of child. What metric am I in? I'm in logits. How do I get from logits to proportion correct? Inverse link. Yeah, so this is the logit of the probability of getting any one item correct. So it's the logit of the proportion, essentially, is what we can shorten that to. And I already did that math. That corresponds to a probability of 0.96. So children without SLI whose mothers have a high school degree have a expected proportion correct of 0.956. Very, very close to the boundary. What happens in children with SLI? I have a negative 1.22 coefficient that is significant. Children with SLI, how do I talk about that? Because this is the tricky part. We can all get R and Stata to spit out answers. The question is, do we know what to do with them on the back end? The fact that they don't tell you is why I still have a job. And why you all will have jobs someday if you learn these things. So the coefficient for the slope for NLI versus SLI is minus 1.22. What does that tell me? Eagerly watching the chat. 
decreases the logit of the probability of getting one item right by one by minus 1.22. Yes, so the decrease. In other words, children with SLI have a lower logit, a lower expected proportion correct. And can I take that slope and convert it into some kind of change in the proportion? It is a negative effect. And it would imply an odds ratio between 0 and 1. That is also correct. Can I take this slope and somehow change it into talking about a proportion or a probability? Nope. Nope. I can only take it down to an odds ratio. I can't take it any further. So I can take this slope of nine, minus 1.22 and say e to that number and turn that into an odds ratio. And indeed I did. So I asked for odds ratios via the e form option of Stata and that's an odds ratio of 0.29. So negative slopes correspond to odds ratios between 0 and 1. But I cannot use this minus 1.22 in logits to say anything directly about probability. What I could do is compute a predicted logit for the SLI group, and I can do the math in my head. That would be 3 minus 1.22, so 2 or, yeah, <laughs> I can't do the math in my head. I, just, I was just kidding. 1.78-ish? Does that sound about right? Does Zoom do math? Probably not. Yeah. No, I can't do the math in my head. That's the, that's the dirty secret. I learned all this stuff and basic math went out. I can't math. No, it's fine. That's what the computer's for. Point being, I can figure out what the predicted logit is for the SLI group, and I can take that predicted logit and convert it into a proportion or a probability. But I cannot convert the slope into something that's probability. What about mother's education? That's a positive coefficient, also significant. What do I do with that? Who's feeling brave? Or who's willing to answer so class can be over? How about that? Slope of 0.12 in logits. As mother's education increases by 1 beyond 12th grade, the logit of getting one item right increases by 0.12. Exactly. So people with mothers with higher education have higher predicted outcomes. But this is in logits, and we'd have to back translate those predicted outcomes into probabilities. We want to talk about, so AIC and BAC, by the way, we're going to use to talk about relative differences in distributions down the road. So that's why I asked for those things. These are information criteria. These are corrections to minus two log likelihood based on the number of parameters in the model. I have a joint walled test of those two slopes. So this is the analog of the F test for your model in linear regression. This is doing a chi-square test rather than an F because we're not using denominator degrees of freedom. And it looks like we have a wildly significant model. However, this still doesn't fit very well. The distribution's fit is still 15. So it's better than the 22 it was before, but it's still way too high. So I have a note that this is probably way too optimistic because the distribution does not have enough variance in it yet, which means our standard errors are going to be way too small. Here's the odds ratios. So 0.3 is the odds ratio for the group effect. 1.1 is the odds ratio for the mother education slope. In R, same thing, where my two new predictors are at the end of my formula. I asked for minus 2 log likelihood AIC and BIC, and I've labeled those for you right here. We get the same exact solution, just with intercept listed first. We get the same distribution fit after I make it myself, subtracting three because I now have three fixed effects in the model. I get the same, very close to the same result, not quite, in the multivariate wall test because 
the standard errors are being computed differently in R than in Stata, so a little bit of difference there, and those are my odds ratios. So where we're headed next time then is trying to do a better job of capturing the variability in this distribution. It looks like binomial is not enough. We have over dispersion because we have more variance in the residuals than what the model is anticipating. So that's where we get into different strategies for dealing with that, but that will wait until next week. How's that sound? Yeah, no one's going to argue with that. Any questions before we call it a week? No questions. All right. Well, if you think of any, let me know. You can be working on finishing homework three. I will let you know when the info is ready for homework five, and I hope everyone has a good weekend. Thanks for being here. I hope to be back in person next week. We shall see. That's the plan anyway. All right. Bye, folks. <laughs>